Hello and welcome everybody to the Responsible Edge podcast with me, Charlie Martin. Um, the Responsible Edge, as a reminder, is your go-to source for lessons in how to implement ethical and effective marketing strategies. Today, I was delighted to be joined by Simon Corby. Uh, Simon is the Director of the Alliance of Sustainable Building Products, a not-for-profit mission-led membership organization. Um, their mission is to lead the transformation to a healthy, low-carbon built environment by championing the understanding and use of demonstrably sustainable building products. And what was interesting about our conversation today is we really kind of focused in on that um, demonstrably term. Um, Simon has some fantastic uh, insights, specifically looking at the building products industry um, and, and, and some of the kind of key concerns around um, evidence and testing um, and, the, and, the, and the making of claims. Um, in particular, we kind of reflected on, on some of the uh, lessons learned from, from Grenfell um, and, and the tragedy that it was um, from a communications perspective um, and the impact that that's had upon evidence and sharing and perhaps some of the work that the ASBP as an organization have been looking to do in order to encourage their members to essentially um, open up and collaborate with one another on sharing uh, information to improve things across across the sector. So, really, really interesting in terms of in terms of that. Looking at the um, that as a kind of key next step in terms of improving standards of communication. So, um, I hope you guys enjoy enjoy the show um, and, and and get something from it. Um, as I said, this one today is probably more specifically focused on you know on a particular sector, um, but hopefully you enjoy it. As I say, um, if you've got any comments or questions, as always, we'd love to hear them. So please feel free to um, to, to share those with us. Um, and thanks again for listening. Really appreciate it. Well, Simon, um, thank you so much for for agreeing to to join us today um, and uh, and to give your your take on some uh, some genuinely interesting themes that we've just kind of been discussing. I think in our in our preamble um, regarding kind of ethical and responsible marketing and comms. Um, before we dive into though some of those subjects, Simon, just love to kind of uh, hear from you and give, get a bit of background on you and your experience and your kind of career so far. Yeah, great. Thanks, Charlie. Um, thanks for the welcome. So um, I am director at the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products, and I've been working within sustainability probably for 25 years or so now. Um, so I um, did a lot of traveling when I was um, in my youth came back to London and, and, and sort of wondered what it is that I should be doing with myself and felt that I needed to have a purpose. Um, and um, my friend told me about this new green, green builders merchants. It was called Construction Resources. Uh, and um, so I thought, well, that sounds brilliant. I'll go and check that out. It was in Southwark. Um, and it was very much like the Design Museum. It was a really fancy place. Three stories of cut through models showing you know showing details of junctions um rainwater harvesting system inbuilt within the building solar pv solar thermal and a, and, and some beautiful displays and then a an area for teaching and training and a workshop so it was a really splendid place and so i walked in there and said oh i'd li like to work for you please and they said, well, what, 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 what experience have you got, you know, around sustainability? And I said, well, really not very much. Um, so I ended up working in, 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 the, uh, in the stores uh, and um, moving pallets of paint around the place. Um, and um, so basically looking after a, a couple of warehouses and dealing with um, uh, all the stuff and unloading it and reloading it and so on. Um, yeah, so I spent about five years there, and um, so that was the beginning of my uh, introduction, really, to to um, all things sustainable. And it was a fantastic place. So we had like the environment minister at the time, Michael Meacher. Um, so he came around. People would just sort of drop in, or they'd be organised tours. Um, and so I remember him coming around, and my job was to take people around, show them, show them the solar thermal, show them the solar PV. And he was sort of, and he said to me, I remember this so clearly, and he said, what's the difference between solar PV and a solar thermal? And, and it's like, you're the environment minister. <laughs> you really should know. <laughs> so we sort of had to go back to basics and um, explain to him, you know, the difference and roughly how they worked. I'm still not entirely sure, but um, 
and um, yeah, so that was a really fascinating place to to work. And the, and the crew that were there have gone on to do really great things. So one colleague, John Favarg, has gone on to start Urban. So Urban focus on mass timber buildings. So him and Liam Dewar um, have uh, for the last twenty years um, been designing constructing um, mass timber buildings and they've done hundreds um, and um, the whole crew there went on has gone on to do really really exciting things so it was a great introduction fantastic uh, it, Simon that that you got that's a wonderful bit of um, of sort of uh, recommended approach to to realizing a new job opportunity turn up and suggest you don't know anything about that particular subject but you're keen to give it a go um i absolutely think that's brilliant um i just want to go, just go back slightly you you went traveling and you realized i i want to do something with purpose what was it about going into sort of green building and construction etc what was it that drew you specifically to that in terms of finding that purpose? Well, I was, um, I mean, I qualified as a chartered surveyor by by that stage in my, uh, I, I made sure I got qualified before I, want, before I went traveling. Um, so I'd been working in um, my last job as a surveyor, I'd been working in Dartford as a valuer and economic development officer. So I had some, um, um, something to do with blue water uh, and uh, crossways and, um, so it was, it was quite an exciting role. The council actually had quite a big portfolio of like a theatre and, and my responsibility was to, um, you know, to look after the management and maintenance of all of these buildings, including the Civic Centre. Um, so it was a, it was a quite challenging um, job, but um, the, the sort of danger is that, um, you know, that, that, yeah, working for um, property owners, you you can end up just making money for people who've got lots of money. Um, and um, so I felt that I, I'm much happier sort of working for perhaps the tenant who was being um, told that it was time for a rent review or um, I, that I just felt that there must be a bigger purpose towards behind this whole built environment thing. And obviously sustainability at that stage when we just started to understand about about climate change um, and um, um, the Kyoto Treaty and so on. Um, and so it just seemed like a, a, a really great fit. Um, and also I was living on a you know, on, on a boat, boat in St. Catherine's docks, um, which if you if you know London is is just down the road from Southwark. Um, so I could hop on my bicycle. Uh, and cycle along the towpath and be at construction resources in 10 minutes. Um, and um, so it was just hugely convenient. And I knew that I would learn so much because there were architects there, there were engineers there, um, you know, who would be able to size a rainwater harvesting system for your building uh, or size, a, you know, a PV array for your building according to your needs. I knew there were architects there who specialised in passive house, which was just coming out at that time. Um, so I, I knew that it was going to be a, a fantastic sort of learning uh, opportunity. Um, yeah. But it, it was that it was that the cause, I suppose, that really appealed to me the most. Yeah. And you and you mentioned the Kyoto Agreement. Do you do you remember that kind of that that kind of real sort of sit up and take notice moment for you in terms of sustainability, in terms of that? the climate change element Did, what, was there a particular moment that you can recall that just really impacted you or was it sort of a growing sense of this being important to you yes i think it was a growing sense um so you know i think we've been talking about carbon dioxide entering into the atmosphere for some many years previous to that um but it was on the periphery i think but kyoto certainly helped put it put, put all of that onto the map and i think that was the big 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 thing um and then there was sort of the brundtland definition of sustainability um and um yeah i mean it just became it just became such a big topic mm. so quickly and then and then i moved to to bedzet which is beddington zero emission development which was london's largest sort of eco development um in South London in a place called Hackbridge. Uh, and it was by the Peabody Trust who were sort of pathfinders really 
um, and Bill Dunster and Z Factory were the architects. And I work for Bioregional, who were based at Bed Z, who are an environmental charity. Um, and um, so, yeah, it was a fascinating development, 100 homes and then workspaces. And, um, and it was at that stage I thought, well, I'd better do some sort of qualification uh, in this area because I've got, I've just, you know, I've got nothing that says I know what I'm talking about. So... So, um, so I thought, well, I better sign up for a Sorry, master's. Simon, we're getting a bit of a theme here from the early days of turning up and looking for a job and ending up in the stores. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm enjoying it. So, so what did yeah, what did you do at that point? Well, I thought it was time to 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 look at doing a master's degree. Um, so I signed up to University of East London and CAT uh, Centre of Alternative Technology. So they were doing um, a sort of joint masters at the time, um, and um, so it was, um, you know, a part-time master's course. So I did that uh, between 2003, 2006. And then I did my thesis on the bedside lessons. So I felt that, you know, post-completion, there was quite a lot of stuff that we needed to learn from bedside that perhaps wasn't really being properly discussed. So if you like, it was supposed to be a sort of post-completion review, looking at, you know, all things from quality through to costs to where costs like jumped up um, and issues between issues around how um, um, the contracts to build the building were let. Um, yeah, and so it was a pretty broad dissertation and anybody who's looking at doing a dissertation, my advice ever since has been to keep it really narrowly focused on one question, um, not, not this massively broad uh, uh, aspect that I sort of attempted to do. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it was, I was pleased to, I mean, that, that, that my thesis has been downloaded thousands of times. Um, and I was constantly, been constantly asked through years for copies of it, less so now, um, because Bed Z is, I think, something like 25 years old. Um, and so, you know, it's sort of nestled in, in the past, if you like. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, um, but still by regional being based at um, being based there meant that Saturn became a, a one planet living borough and one planet living became a thing. So by regional started that one planet living concept. Um, and um, yeah, so there's been, you know, reverberations and um, knock on effects. So the first passive house school um, is called the Harris Academy was has been built in Saturn. Um, and you know a lovely mass timber building and um, to passive house so um, so it continues to be um, you know a, a, an area where there have been firsts and you know more firsts mm -hmm. so yeah so that's really encouraging and then and then after that I, uh, I started with working with um, John Bootland and John Bootland runs the Sustainable Development Foundation you, you should try and get him on for your podcast um, so within that organization, there's a, an umbrella of companies that have been set up uh, and we, the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products, are one of those companies. And then there's the Passive House Trust, so focusing in on Passive House. And then there's STBA, and that's the Sustainable and Traditional Building Alliance. And then there are a range of other organizations that are focused either on a particular thing building performance evaluation, for example, or on a particular um, building typology. So the Good Homes Alliance has a focus on social housing um, and council housing, both old and new. Um, yeah, so, um, but the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products, I think is quite unique in the fact that we've got a, you know, our focus is on the product level. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, our, we have a mission statement, um, and that mission is to lead the transformation to a healthy and low carbon built environment um, by championing the use of de demonstrably sustainable building products. So um, we've just been looking at that mission statement. So that's why I can actually quote it to you uh, and wondering whether we need to refresh it. Um, and those discussions are sort of ongoing uh, as we speak. Um, yeah, so uh, um, we launched, uh, ASDB launched in 2011, 
um, at Palace of Westminster. It launched with no members at all um, and a charter, really. Um, and we've sort of grown it. We're now 150 members, um, you know, and we've got five, six research projects on the go, a quite a broad variety of different research projects. Um, and yeah, we do lots of events. We've got an event on uh, later today um, on natural fiber insulation and the retrofit challenge. Um, we've got something like 500 people signed up to that. So that's really good. Um, and then at the end of this month, we've got our Healthy Buildings Conference. So, um, you know, a day looking uh, in the real world um, rather than online, because we've been online through COVID, um, but we've got back together. And so we're going to be seeing people uh, in real life uh, and, yeah, based at the building center. Um, and so we've got a really nice program of speakers. It's going to be a really interesting and informative day. Simon, you are the smoothest operator going. You've managed to, uh, in, in, in the introduction to you and your background, you've managed to get through and plug, uh, you know, numerous ASBP events and initiatives, et cetera, all in that first part. So that was absolutely sensationally done, I have to say. Before we come back to, and uh, crescendo perhaps, with some more focus on some of the ASBP initiatives and events that are coming up, um, just wanted to ask you, you you've obviously... Uh, Came, come on the responsible edge today and understanding that our focus is on kind of responsible and ethical marketing practice and, and understanding the importance of it and strategies to implement it. Speaking either personally or from the perspective of the ASBP, I thought it was fascinating when you mentioned that mission statement and the use of the term just demonstratively um, mm. and actually how related this is. But what does responsible or ethical marketing kind of mean to you and the organization? Well, it basically means truthful. Um, I mean, having worked in the business of selling product, uh, there is a real danger of overstating, you know, because you want your product to be the best in class. You want your product to stand out. And there's a, there is a, I mean, it's just human nature, I suppose, to sort of, you know, you love your product. So you, you know, you talk it up. Um, but there is a, there is a danger that you, come into areas that you know you perhaps are, are, are not you can't back up you can't prove um so i mean to give you you know one example we've had to remove somebody from membership of asvp um because of their green claims um we felt that and i'm definitely not going to be mentioning any names or telling you what uh, even what the product sort of category is um, but we felt that they were overstating um, their green claims and we challenged them and, and gave them an opportunity to change them uh, and um, they just sort of didn't. And, and so we just had to, um, you know, ask them to leave the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products. We need to be, we need to be careful about... Um, the claims that people are making about products um, and we need to satisfy ourselves that those claims are realistic they're backed up with some sort of evidential um, thing so you know for example I've, I mean we have a paints and finishes group um, that comes together and the sort of things that exercises that group is this claim for zero VOCs mm. Now, we know, and, you know, most physics, physicists and chemists would tell you there is no such thing, really, as zero VOCs. Um, it's sort of minimal or there's a sort of very, there's a low threshold. But there are some paint companies that insist on using that as their strap line. And, um, you know, and, 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 and it's just false. So um, for me, um, you know, I get quite exercised um, when I see things like that because I know that it's not true. And perhaps not everybody knows that that's not true. And you just get drawn in with that sort of promise, which is, which is um, you know, wrong, um, basically. So, uh, I mean, in Europe, as I'm sure you know, um, there is now this sort of green claims um process so you're not really allowed to say uh, anything about your product that you can't back up by some sort of document 
And usually that's an environmental product declaration or an EPD. So if you're looking to say that your product is low carbon, you need to be able to back it up um, with a, an EPD that says, yes, look, my product is low carbon because it's been tried, it's been tested, it's been third party verified and, and there's the proof. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't have that yet here. Um, so at the moment, it's it's more difficult to um, to you know ask um, for um, EPDs because it's still a it's still a growth area. So environmental product declarations they are definitely becoming mandatory uh, in uh, Europe. We are still in Europe. We still sell to Europe, um, and so I think EPDs, environmental product declarations will become more and more important over time. And we're finding that, you know, even some of our small companies, um, for example, Thermofleece that sell cheap swill insulation, I mean, they've invested a fairly, you know, chunky sum of money uh, in, in getting uh, EPDs for all of their products. Um, and the same with Clayworks, and they sell clay plaster, they're in Cornwall, um, and they've invested in EPDs um yeah so um it's it's absolutely essential that the 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 marketing claims the things that you're talking about when you're talking about your products are accurate um because otherwise you will be challenged i mean that's the thing of it so you as a as a communicator need mm. to be confident uh, about you know look even i would suggest looking at an epd and understanding what it's telling you and I'm not sure I mean there's a long way to go because lots of architects will look at an EPD and not really know what it means and they are complex documents uh, mm -hmm. and they do cover it's not just global warming they cover a whole range of different environmental indicators and um, there's a lot of learning for us all to do to be honest with you um, in that Simon, can I, I think that was that was a brilliant response to the question of kind of why ethical and responsible practice in terms of marketing and communications is important to the ASBP. We've obviously spoken before about the article from, I think, back in July last year, I think it was, where, um, that, that, that we shared with you regarding the um, BRE's uh, decision to essentially, you know, sever ties with Kingspan due to um, some of the implications of the, the Grenfell Tower inquiry. Um, just specifically picking you up on, on that point, because I think lots of our listeners will be aware of, of, of what happened at Grenfell. I don't think we necessarily have to necessarily go over all ground, you know, mm -hmm. with, with exactly you know, what happened with the, with the tragedy. However, you've mentioned there about the requirement for evidence and the requirement for third party verification through the form of EPDs. Kingspan, I think, would argue and have argued, certainly in that article, that when you look at the, the, the products that, that they have on the market, that they have carried out the appropriate verification with their parties and adherence to regulations in terms of the products that, that are available, which is their grievance, I suppose, in terms of the B, uh, BRE's decision to, 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 um, to remove their relationship or to end their relationship. What's your what's your take? I know it's very nuanced. I know it's complicated. But what's your take on on that specifically when it comes to this particular case? Well, I mean, uh, your your article or your reference to the article prompted me to go back and listen to some of the um, Grenfell inquiry, and um, it has to be said that that everybody is at fault. Mm -hmm. um, so the BRE were definitely at fault. Um, so it, it's a little bit sort of like closing the the, the stable door. But I, mean, I sort of just I just made some notes here. So so back in I think sorry. So yeah, back in um, two thousand and one. Uh, the BRE tested 14 cladding systems, including um, the cladding system that was used at Grenfell. And um, it, within five minutes, the flames had reached 20 metres high. So the, the full-scale test is 10 metres. If you reach the top of that, you failed. But if you, 
But so in five minutes, the flames were 20 meters high. So that is a conflagration. That is serious um, spread of flame. So, I mean, that was a test that was done in 2001 and um, it was paid for by the government um, and the BRE reported to government. And so they felt that their job was done. But so we knew, we knew in 2001 of the dangers of this cladding system. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it was selected for Grenfell in 2015 or 2016, you know, you can see that that's an absolute travesty. Um, and the same, you know, every, as I said, everybody, everybody um, showed pro you know problems with their system. So the BBA certification system, which is separate to the BRE, you know, I mean, they certified the Ar the Arconic um, product, um, but um, um, you know, the information that, that was presented to them. Um, meant that they they gave it a fire class rating, but only as a flat sheet. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the fact that it was wrapped around like a cassette at um, Grenfell meant that it was actually a different product. With a BBA um, certification, it is that product in that situation. And as soon as you move that product or put something else in to a system, then then that's a, another you need another BBA um, certificate. But um Sorry, Simon. Sorry, carry on. Yeah. Sure. No, go on. I, I was only going to ask, so coming back to your point though about the need for, you know, talking, you know, when you're working with your with your members at the ASBP, you know, one of your key focuses is, guys, we need evidence to back up the claims that have been, it's not a, it's not a mandate, mandatory thing for here in the UK, it is in Europe, but ultimately that's the encouragement to, to do so and to develop yeah. people touch for your products. Is it also fair to say, though, that there's examples or situations like, I guess, the one that we're just describing with with, with Kingspan, et cetera, and, 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 the, and Glenfell, whereby it's actually the context and the um, nuance, I guess, of how that evidence relates to the claims that you're making about your product that also needs to be factored in? Because, of course, I think, again, just another example from another episode that we had previously was when um, one of our guests was talking about a piece of research that NASA had done regarding um, the health implications of plants um, for astronauts in terms of their experience of, you know, high amounts of oxygen, et cetera, in the race. And what they then had was, um, and again, I can't remember the name, but there was a, a you know, a, an office um, plant sort of, uh, organization business that then used that piece of evidence Mm -hmm. referencing that it was from a reputable source i.e it's nasa mm. piece of research Great. that that therefore could be applied to their literature in terms of the claims they were making about their plants now mm. clearly that that, that it, the context of the evidence cannot be therefore relevant and used for the sale of a product in a completely different environment uh, very much akin to what you're describing there in terms of the boards being flat versus etc so how do you go about with your with, with your ASBP hat on, mm. what how are you looking to address the issue of not just the evidence, but the context in which that evidence has been produced and whether or not it relates to the claim? Is that a key area of concern for you guys? Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I mean, um, you know, the, certainly the systems that were pre Grenfell relied relied on companies being honest and being forthcoming with with information and test data and actually all of these companies Arconic, Kingspan and Celotex were not honest or forthcoming about test data and and um, you know you they've taken a system and they perverted it I can't think of a better word really mm -hmm. um, so um, I mean that has had all sorts of ramifications there's been um, a real knock-on effect from Grenfell, which, you know, one uh, would hope for, I suppose, but there's been quite a lot of unintended consequences. But, um, yeah, I mean, because, for example, EPDs need to be third-party tested and verified, I mean, that is an essential part of that whole process. You're not marking your own homework. 
you're not saying oh look at us you know our product's great because we we did this test and and it's signed off it, it, i mean it's basically needs somebody else to look at it and go hang on a moment this you know this doesn't sound right that doesn't look right um and so that third party piece is really important um and Simon, just on that point, just this is for my benefit, but I imagine there are listeners who are uh, just in terms of EPD knowledge are perhaps not as informed as you are. When I'm when I'm engaging with a third party to produce an EPD for my product, yeah. will the that third party indicate to me what I can or cannot then claim relating to that product in terms of we've done the test for the product in this context? please be aware that you can therefore only share messages and claims about the use of the product within that context and that you can't expand it beyond. Mm. Um, I mean, I suppose the EPD is, is provided as a document and it's up to you to try and interpret it. Okay. Um, so it's the, they, they don't tend to then pull out the sort of marketing messages, the key messages that I suppose that's really for the manufacturer to do. Um, and some manufacturers um, will go about trying to do their own EPDs in-house. And, um, you know, I think there's a real benefit to doing that because you can start to soon work out hotspots, you know, where where all of a sudden your carbon is spiking and you're, you, you know, okay, I need to look at transportation for this product. I need to think about sourcing this product more locally, closer to home. I need to think about maybe looking at this aspect of the product and seeing if we can put something else in there. And, um, you know, so there is a real, there is a, um, it is a quite a useful tool for manufacturers to understand, completely understand their product from a, you know, from start to finish. Mm -hmm. So it will go down to the level. So uh, Clayworks, they produce um, their product um, in a brown sack in a brown paper sack and it's um, held together with string. Um, so it's sewn in at the top to, to keep the clay plaster within the bag. And the EPD, they wanted to know all the detail about that string and where it came from and where it was sourced and everything. So the level of detail that these um, EPDs go into is significant and they, cover, well, they all cover everything, all the impacts associated with your product all the packaging so you know all of those issues all of the transport all of the everything so so it is a complete picture um and and that's that's i suppose why we like them um at the alliance for sustainable building products we we think it's a language of the future we think the products you know um you know everybody should be looking at epds and um um you know it's, but it is an investment um and architects need to need to know more about them. Surveyors need to know more about them. We need to know how um, you know we could interpret EPDs, which is why we, as an organisation, have spent quite a lot of time looking at EPDs um, for architects. You know, what are the ten most important things that you can draw from an EPD that is useful to you? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so yeah. So I think that's that's very valuable, but. I mean, it's, you know, going back to Kingspan, um, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult subject. It's quite an emotive subject, of course, because it was such a tragedy. Um, but I fully expected Kingspan to go bust quite soon after Grenfell. Um, but, of course, they've not. And actually, the, although their share prices have taken a hit, they haven't, they haven't gone uh, down, you know, haven't gone to the wall, which is... Mm possibly what I thought. And now what they're doing, as you may or may not know, is is acquiring a whole range of natural fiber insulation products. Right. Wow. So okay. they, I think, have realized that the future is is natural. Mm -hmm. They realize that their product, which is a you know byproduct of the oil and gas industry, is perhaps yesterday's product. And so they are looking to the future and investing and buying up their own or buying spree. Um, so they brought a, a, a very large German uh, wood fiber company um, who, who, who actually make a whole range of bio-based products. Um, and um, they've brought up another company that sells hemp insulation. So uh, they are busily morphing 
into a into a company that 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 has a quite a broad portfolio of insulation products ranging from you know the kingspan as we know it phenolic foam products and through to hemp and wood fiber so um i mean i would i would do that if i were them as well i mean the future clearly is that bio-based direction um and um you know they they know that uh and are um doing something about it um, and i suppose the other the other is fascinating simon thank you for giving us that kind of overview of, of their i guess strategic direction i i would hope that another one of their kind of key lessons was from the whole um debacle in many ways tragedy is probably a more suitable way of putting it is that the future in telling the truth on that point what do you think is you know and i know that grenfell is we're still feeling the wider broader implications of it but what are you, you know what's your experience what's your thought and perhaps what are the things that the asbp has done since grenfell in order to kind of begin to support the development of of trust again within the you know the building materials market what are the things that you see happening well i suppose there's um i mean there's there's I've been a you know a whole raft of new legislation so um um but that has affected products you know timber products for example so um anything that's combustible timber is combustible uh, has now been ruled out of being in the external wall over 18 meters and there's a real confusion as to whether they're allowed in buildings over 11 meters or not and uh, as far as i'm concerned they are but uh, there was consultation to reduce the um the size of the building down to 11 meters and as far as i'm concerned that didn't happen um but it's still very quite vague so there's lots of confusion and so there is a um there is a bit of a kickback i think when it comes to timber buildings generally so even in london i think you're prevented um for social housing to have timber in the external wall of any social housing at any height um and so the you know, grenfell has had lots of repercussions and although there was no timber at all on grenfell it's had this um sort of massive impact across a whole range of of other products timber specifically um so as to as to as to trust um i think there's a long way to go charlie um i mean because um the grenfell inquiry which is still um uh, you know they're still writing their report um i mean it's in, it's it's so damning um across really the whole industry and there's a, a lots of reputational work that we all need to do to restore trust i think um so you know we work for example with all of the natural fiber insulation group manufacturers here um, suppliers here in the uk so we've brought them together they're all competitors um but we've brought them together to collaborate um which is quite a nice model in itself um and when we first started doing that um they were all quite closed and um you know they didn't really know how to talk to each other really mm -hmm. and five years later um it's a very different ball game um and so everyone's working together to try and harmonize marketing messages to look at the sort of um the benefits of natural fiber insulation so it's not just the low carbon it's the health and the well-being aspect of things it's the um you know the circular economy aspect of things um and i suppose i like to think that we do keep an eye on the claims that our members make and if there is something that perhaps doesn't look right um we will call them out and we will contact them and we will have a discussion um so um i would like to think there is this sort of um this trust uh, we we are rebuilding trust in our own little way um mm -hmm. without all of our members and you know we've got architects and contractors and manufacturers and suppliers as our members and it feels that between them and um you know yeah architects looking at the products that 
we sell there 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 is a there is now a an area there is a trust mm. um, so is it fair simon is it sorry to jump in but is it fair to say that you're kind of your your reaction or approach to this has been well the influence that we can have is to develop dialogue between different entities peers essentially within the sector with mm. a view that by opening up that conversation we can build trust and empathy and understanding amongst suppliers within a particular sector and that what that will then do as you've alluded to is then improve overall standards of messaging and marketing etc to ensure that things are clear and fair and almost there's almost like a you're encouraging almost like a self-policing element whereby if everybody works closely together then if anybody sort of moves outside of the scope of what's fair and substantiated in terms of their mm -hmm. claims they'll very much be be pulled up on it by the collective is that is that a fair sort of um synopsis of, of the approach that you're taking yes i think so um i mean i i, I and I'm, I'm pleased to see that there are, you know, lots of um, endeavours out there to uh, help uh, collectively share information. So, for example, doing large-scale fire testing, which has now become um, um, de rigueur, really, for most products, is ex really expensive. Mm. Um, and so quite often what happens, particularly looking at mass timber, is that... Um, a developer will be asked to test a particular junction um, and so that will go to a, a large-scale fire test uh, laboratory and it'll be a hundred grand um, to do that test um, and then you know the, the the developer gets the results from that test um, and presents that to building control and to the fire brigade and to the insurers and then, you know, assuming that the test has been um, has been successful, then the building continues. But of course, that's a hundred grand uh, for one test. Um, so we're trying. So there's been um, something called the Fire Hub. The idea is that say um, a place where if you've got a um, a, a, a large scale fire test, that you can upload um, the detail of that there. And it can then be something that is shared. So, mm -hmm. although some developers will see that as their IP, they've they've they, they you know they've spent that money on it. Um, more and more, we're starting to think, well, hang on a minute, we need to share this type of information because um, you know um, I, I'm going to need a fire test that you've done, um, mm -hmm. and rather than me then spending another hundred grand doing a, some a similar test, um, let's share this information. So, this sharing and collaboration piece. I think is really really important um and um and, and that's part and parcel of rebuilding trust really because it's sort of building the evidence base and mm. you know with evidence you can't you can't you can't argue with evidence you know it is sort of assuming assuming the test has been you know professionally done yeah there's almost like it's the open sourcing of evidence i guess and enabling yeah, exactly. access to and and i guess if if we were and i know we were we were wary of today having a conversation that went too into the dark and gloomy of of, of obviously the the tragedy that was glenfell but if there was a key outcome and experience that you've had in the work that you've done and that you're continuing to do as the asbp um a legacy if you like of of something that was so terrible then actually the opening up of those lines of dialogue and the openness to sharing information and appreciation and understanding that in order to mitigate these instances happening again, we need honest, open, transparent, independently verifiable information to be shared. So these these the sorts of decisions that led to Glenfell don't happen again. So it, it's got a flavor. I, I know we wanted to crescendo with something, a yeah. positive yeah. message, and it's almost that collective sharing of information that is the is the positive outcome i guess absolutely i think that's i think that's the key that's the key outcome and it is a positive outcome um and although it is you know horribly tragic um it does it does feel that there has been a sort of um, a, a raft of positive outcomes and that's definitely one of them um but this sort of whole evidence-based piece is absolutely crucial so, you know, as I'm sure you know, most people in fires die of smoke asphyxiation rather than, you know, through flames. And it's the products that burnt 
um, that had carbon monoxide and, and then uh, a range of other um, poisonous gases um, that, that caused so many people to expire at Grenfell. And so yeah. that testing um, of, um, you know, a, a burn test and then testing what happens when it burns, you know, is really, really crucial. And also the impact that a product will have on indoor air quality is also really crucial. Um, so one one certification system that we really like is something called Nature Plus, which is an eco label. Um, and what they do is that they, they look at the carbon piece like an EPD and that's verified. And then they also look um, at, at the uh, indoor air quality, health and well-being aspect of the product. So the product is sent to the lab, not a, not their lab, but a lab. And um, you know, it sits in a in a box for 28 days, and all the off gassing, etc., is measured. Um, and then, you know, you have to make sure that you uh, don't exceed various thresholds that the Nature Plus Commission, uh, in their because uh, they've got vast experience, they say, well, this is the absolute threshold. So usually WHO type requirements. So you can only get a Nature Plus certification if 85% of your product is from renewable sources so it can be grown if you like so something like Celotex and Kingspan is is immediate fail so there are only if you like there's a triangle of products and it's really right at the very tip the apex of that triangle is this nature plus certification system um, but we think it's really very credible because it, it means that an architect doesn't have to wade through lots of you know EPDs and and test test data to go okay well it's low carbon and it's healthy that's it i know mm. that i can select it and and move on you know um mm. so um yeah we think that's a very credible credible system um and um yeah we'd like to see more of that here in the uk yeah um, so um yeah fantastic simon fantastic Simon, um, I, I get a sense that we could, uh, and I have to say for our listeners, I think that's been an absolutely fascinating look into some of the nuance and I guess some of the detail around the, you know, the the, the building material market and um, and some of the nuance of the considerations that go into the marketing and the presentation of information. Um, and we're going to have to get you back on. I'm afraid we've run out of time for, for today's session, as long as you've enjoyed yourself. Um, before we go, though, Simon, um, we always like to finish the sessions just with, um, you know, a key bit of advice that you would offer as obviously somebody as experienced and senior within within the um, material um, building material industry. If you were speaking to a junior marketeer who was working for any one of the the members that you work for and you were to offer them a bit of advice as a communications or marketing professional hmm. on something that they should consider when looking to develop their career um can be very specific to to the sector if, if you like or it can be more general but what would be something that you would offer to them well um i suppose i would probably um say you know look look at some of our videos and webinars that we've done on epds and how you can um interpret them because that is the basic the basis of of, of your communication um so if you can interpret an epd and understand what the various indicators are and what they mean then you know you are going to be a really useful communicator so although it's a bit dry, that's probably um, probably what I would suggest. Um, and, and yeah, I think you'll be well, you'll probably be sort of telling your client things that they didn't know about their product, which is, you know, which is would be a real feather in your cap. Simon, I love it. We often get people offering some fairly kind of, uh, I'd call it sort of loose, generic advice, if you like. But I think that's brilliant that, you know, to suggest, look, if you guys want to get ahead as a marketer or communicator in the Absolutely. sector, the thing to do is to really get get very clear and knowledgeable in terms of EPDs and your interpretation of them. You've mentioned your resources there. Let's give you, you, you were fantastic at plugging at the beginning of the call. Let's give you one more chance to, to plug at the end. Where can they specifically get 
get that information regarding interpretation of EPDs? Yeah, so uh, our website is www.asbp.org.uk. So that's the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products, ASBP. Um, so and on that website, in our resources section, we've got all of our webinars. We are a knowledge sharing organization. We aim to uh, inspire, we aim to um, make sure that everybody's um, up to speed and working together against this climate change and biodiversity crisis. So yeah, we share as much information as we, cost, as we can at little or no cost. Um, so there's loads and loads of information and, um, uh, and uh, reports and webinars and briefing papers. Uh, which, however you, you, know, you best consume information, there's, there's a version for you. We are looking to revamp our website and um, perhaps make it a bit simpler to to access and break. We're going to break webinars down so um, um, so again they're more accessible. But that's all a sort of process, I suppose. Um, yeah, and then um, we've um, got our healthy buildings event at the end of February on the 29th of February. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to that. And it's a slightly different subject for us. We're looking at how the construction industry should be responding to the biodiversity crisis. Um, and um, so it's a, a look at how, um, so some manufacturers are starting to measure and monitor biodiversity in their sites uh, and uh, how they can look to increase it. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, a long look at, um, uh, around that, around that. So uh, we're broadening out um, to these types of things. So yeah, do join us. We're at the Building Centre on the 29th of February, and then we'll be at uh, Future Build at Excel. We've got a stand, so we're there across the three days. Uh, we've got drinks with the Austrian Embassy on the Wednesday, which is the sixth, I think, of March. Um, so if you'd like a free beer um, and uh, want to find out a bit more about the links between Austria and, and the UK, come and find us at the uh, Austrian Embassy and join us and have a have a have a beer with us. Fantastic, Simon! Absolutely fantastic! What a what a brilliant! I mean, as I say, your your plugging is 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 ne is not to be outdone. That was fantastic. Um, we're very much looking forward to seeing you at Future Build um, and having a proper catch up. Um, I just want to say a big, big thank you to you for joining us today and uh, for a fascinating insight. Um, we'll leave it there for now, but thanks again, Simon. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. I really enjoyed myself. It's been a, a very relaxed session. And um, yeah, uh, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's been a real pleasure chatting to you.